Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Alex Mendez. Some people call me Blue Brawl, some people call me Mendex, but that's not relevant. What's relevant is that you're here today for a tutorial on using Slade 3 to modify your Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch maps. So I've got a giant list of table of contents here, a lot of topics to cover, a lot of links to send you to, a lot of things that I can only cover the basics of because I don't have a whole lot of experience with, but not to worry, there's a giant wiki filled with details on all the different topics I'm going to be covering today. So. Let's get started. Uh, the first thing you want to do is uh, go to the, the uh, website to download Slade. It's in the description and which, when you get to the URL, what you'll find is a list of latest beta releases and latest stable releases. And so what I like to do is I like to grab the latest installer, latest stable installer, and then just run the executable here. It's a fairly small file, 31.2 megabytes. Now Windows will say that it hasn't recognized this app before. and that it might put your PC at risk, but I just click run anyway. And what this will do is it'll go through the process of installing Slade onto your computer. So it's going to create a desktop shortcut, unpack all the files, and then once you're done, you'll have the option to launch Slade directly. And so this is what the Slade UI looks like. You can see here, there's a list of recent files, the latest Slade news, a bunch of little buttons here. So I'm just gonna go real quick over these. A button means new WAD archive, so if you want to just make a new WAD file, you can start there. If you want to make a new PK3 file, you could just start a new zip archive. If you want to open a file directly, you can use a little manila folder. If you want to open a directory, you could use the blue folder. If you want to save the file you're currently working on, there's a little blue save disk. If you want to save the file under a different name, you could use the green save disk to save as. And if you're working on multiple files and want to save them all at the same time, there's the save all button right there, which is multiple blue disks. Now, if you want to just close the file that you're currently working on, there's a close button. And if you want to close all files at the same time, there's a close all button. Okay, so now that we've gone over the UI basics, let's actually start opening up a file here to get a good idea of what you can do with Slade. So I'm going to go to the Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch install directory. I'm going to go look for v5d.pk3. And I'm going to click the open button. Now this might take a while on your computer, but once everything is loaded, you can see there's a list of folders for all different types of items. There's a list of maps here, basically made into WAD files, and then a list of text files here, which define different things, such as animation definitions, bot info, campaign info, color map info, font info, and so on and so forth. So what this video is going to cover is not basically how to make your own version of Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch from scratch, but rather how to make a simple map that includes simple recolored uh, tiles, recolored sprites, and even your own modified object. And it's going to build off all, most of the things that you see here inside of v5d.pk3. So that if you want to make mods based off this big pk3 file, you can do that by exporting files from, the, from within and then modifying them to your own liking using Slate, of course. So real quick, I'm gonna look inside one of these WAD files here, and I'm going to basically explain the structure of these WAD files, and we're gonna start with the map info. Now, what you'll see here is there's the label for map, and there's the map code, and the map name. And inside parentheses marks here, you can see there's a level number, there's an indicator for which map this will go to next once this map is completed, uh, definition for the sky texture, definition for music, clip med textures, uh, which is used to make sure that mid textures don't go on for an infinite, go on forever basically. Uh, definition for air control, which is 0 0.5 per the Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch standard. And a par, which is set to seven. Basically what par is for is uh, automating the use of uh, boss music and uh, intense music and victory music inside of the game. So if you just want the Mega Man 7 boss soundtrack, right, for your map, all you gotta do is set the par to seven in the map info file, and you should have all that set up. Now, the texture definitions here are basically definitions for making your own uh, textures out of the tiles, which are included here within PP start and PP underscore end. So you can see here, there's plenty of little recolor tiles small tiles right here that are used to make big textures and I'm going through them very quickly because then there's like at least a hundred of these tiles to go through and what you can see here is that these tiles have their own distinct names and then if you go to the texture definitions here you can see these uh, tile names are referenced 
along with offsets, uh, world panning, and the scale of the textures. But we're going to get more into that later. For now, I just wanted to show you a bit more about what the map wad is supposed to look like. So you also see here, there's the map marker along with the map code. Uh, and it shows the basic layout of the map. And then for the actual map data, you can see right here inside of text map, all the different things, sectors, and uh, how you say, definitions for the map. So again, this is about 316 kilobytes. It goes over basically the definition of every line def, every sector, every side def, etc., etc. Now, behavior is basically the compiled ACS scripts, uh, which can be found here inside of scripts. And you can see that there's scripts for purple water, scripts for purple water movement, scripts for flying, scripts that happen when you respawn, when you enter the map. This is a lot of code that I'm not going to go over because. You know, I expect you people to know how to make your own code. But yeah, this is pretty much how the maps are organized. And you could go to any other maps, such as uh, Mega Man 5 Dr. Wily, <laughs> no, not Dr. Wily, but Mega Man 5 Dark Man. And you can see the same structure here. You got map info, texture files, several tiles, a map marker to show the layout of the map, the actual map data, which is then compiled to make the map, and then also some scripts that show that whenever a person falls into a sector, the game will check if the person has beat call, and if they do, then they can fly up. If they don't, then they fall to their death. And it's compiled into this little behavior file right here, which is nice. Okay. So let's say you want to export some files from the PK3 to use, modify and use inside of your own map. Well, with Slate, that process is incredibly simple. And I'm going to show you how to export maps by going up to the sprites, props, MM6 props, and then I'm going to show you how to export these little sprites right here. These are the sprites for Nightman's Torch, so you can see right here, three frames. Uh, before I do that though, I'm going to also explain the rest of the UI right here. So this E button introduces a new entry. So here we have new marker here to rot it doesn't mean anything if you want to add a new folder inside the pk3 you can just hit the manila folder and again give it a random name and there you got a new folder if you want to import files like say import your own images or music you can just hit the import files button right up here and you can look for what you want to import so you can re-import night textures if you want or import another wad if you want it doesn't really matter uh, the map editor and the run archive buttons are buttons I would never recommend using. Uh, it's simply much easier to test files inside of GZDB or inside of UDB than it is to test them inside of Slate. And that's essentially what the map editor and run archive buttons are for, just testing things. Um, so if you do know how to work with GZDB already, then you don't got to worry about these buttons. Uh, if you don't know, then there's plenty of tutorials to help you get started. I'll link those also in the description. Now, as for the rename button here, this is a simple button. You just select the file you want to rename, then you hit the rename button, and then it asks you to enter a new name, so we're going to name this something smarter. Okay, and then we're going to name this marker something more coherent. Okay. And if you want to delete the folder and delete this little marker here, what you can do is hit the X button up here. And it'll ask you, are you sure you want to delete Smarter? Yes. Are you sure you want to delete Coherent? Yes. Uh, the Import button is practically the same as the Import Files button, although there are more restrictions to this one than before. So again, I just recommend going with the Import Files button if you ever want to introduce some new tiles or music. So finally, that brings us to the Export button here. I'm going to highlight the three sprites that I want to export. And it's going to show the three selected entries. And then I'm going to hit the E button outward. And it's going to ask me where I want to export these files to. So I already exported them to the Slate 3 tutorial files folder. So I'm going to do that again, actually. And now if we go to the Slate 3 file tutorial files folder, we can see that, yep, the sprites are there and they are exported and ready for modification, which is good. 
finally there's the up arrow and the down arrow buttons that move uh, files up and down and this again is to help with organizing the VAP file structure make everything much more readable so you'll notice that well, for example right a lot of the uh, folders are up here a lot of the maps are in between a lot of the definitions are down here look like they're also uh, ordered in alphabetical order which again makes organization very simple and that's good so if I wanted to I can move the palette up down or even export it to the slate through tutorial files and there we go we have a palette to work with <laughs> and even a readme text which is really nice okay so let's move on to the next step so the next step in this slate tutorial is going to be opening your map for editing so what i'm going to do is oh click on the manila folder look inside the slate 3 tutorial files folder for the file i want to use there it is and then hit open and you can see i've already added a ton of little entries here basically this is what i'm going to be explaining what all these little entries are for how you can use them and we're going to start with the map info which i think is the most important file here so as i explained before there's a map label there's the map code and then there's the map name and of course you can change the name to whatever you want but what's important to know is that the map code here in map info has to match up with the map marker right here so you can see the map marker is cmcpxx and in the map info you can see the map code is cmcpxx if these are two different things say this is cmcpxz or xy then this map info will not apply to this map and as a result, all this information is suddenly going to be useless. Your map won't have a name, it won't have air control, it won't have music, it won't have a skybox, it won't have any of that. So, music. Now, Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch has plenty of music you can use, but say for example you want to use your own music. In which case, what you could do is you can import files, look for a track that you really like, and I guess B-Side 08 will do. Okay, and then what you could also do is change the music string from uh, Harmuse to B-side 08. And you have to make sure that the music file is under eight characters. If it's over eight characters, you will have to translate the music. Uh, you will have to use sound info to basically translate the uh, file name to something smaller. And we could do that in a bit. And then of course sky texture black is pretty much the safest bet if you ever have a skybox in your map but you don't have like a skybox viewer or anything like that um basically this will just turn the skybox entirely black so that you don't have to worry about anything or have to worry about any graphical glitches or anything like that it's more of a fail safe than anything else uh, air control is set to 0 0.5 and that basically prevents people from flying across the map uh, by introducing some uh, wind resistance for snow sky stretch uh, to be honest I don't know a whole lot about that but the ZDoom wiki has plenty of info so what we could do now right now is open up ZDoom wiki I'm going to look at here some of the definitions format uh, we're gonna be looking for map definition map properties of course no size stretch so this basically means if you have a sky graphic that looks fine whether it tiles or not you can use this and the sky will never be stretched to this level regardless of the value of our stretch sky so this is why I recommend going through the wiki and reading as much as you can to get a better understanding of map info and then we have clip map textures as well so now when I save this file right here it's going to save the map info and it's going to save the music to this file so now say for example the uh, music is a little too loud well what can we do about that maybe you wish it was a little lower a little bit more tolerable in which case the next step would be to change the sound info file So basically, when it comes to changing the volume of sound or music in your map, what you can do right here is open and create a sound info file, and then we're going to use the command music volume. 
and then we're going to say we're going to set the music volume of track B side 08 to a factor of 0 0.8. So now what that means is the music will be 80% as loud as before. Before it was pretty loud and now when we load it into our map and we test it out on our map it's going to be a lot less ear grating. Now I've opened up the wiki title for this and you can also see that there's uh, different options as well. Music alias basically allows renaming of music tracks. Pitch set can change the pitch. Um, player sounds can be changed. Volume can be changed for also sounds. And there's even examples here listed in the wiki. So this one it says it randomizes a player's death sound to one of three different sounds. So it could be player death sound one, player death sound two, or player death sound three. That way you can add a bit of variety to your map. Okay. And there's even text about how you can um, include different sound info lumps. So we don't have to worry too much about that since we're only going to be making one map and we're going to be editing one map. Um, so now that that's out of the way, the next step is going to be making uh, custom textures. So if you want to make custom textures, uh, it would make a lot of sense to also have custom tiles. So what I'm going to do right here is I'm going to well, I've already made the two entries here, PP start and PP end, and that basically means that these are the uh, markers for patches or tiles to be included into the map. So we're gonna go here to import tiles, go to the desktop, slate through tutorial files, and I made a couple of tiles here to um, make a simple texture with. So as you can see, the three tiles are now included between PP start and PP end, so that the uh, Doom engine or Zandronum engine understands where uh, the tile is going to be coming from. And you can see this texture definitions file I basically made by myself. Um, if you want to make your own texture definitions file with Slade though, what you could do is just delete this. And then we're going to click the T button here for texture editor. And it will show, okay, this archive does not contain any texture definitions. That's fine. Do you wish to create or import a texture definition list? We're going to say yes. And we're going to go with ZDoom format. And we're going to create a new one, basically empty, and it's going to put it down here. Now, like I showed before, it makes a lot of sense to organize your map files. So we're going to put the textures right above the patches right here. Now we're going to go back to text ed editor. It's going to open up the textures file. And you can see here, this is the textures interface. So the list of textures will be to the, on this left column here. The texture name will be here, size, scale, offsets, type, uh, options here for uh, optional, new decals, null texture, and world panning. And then if you want to add tech patches, this is where you would go to the right column. You can see this uh, button for adding new patches, removing old patches, uh, moving patches up a list, moving patches down a list, replacing patches that have been selected, or duplicating patches that have been selected. And for each patch, you have an option to change the X offset, the Y offset, uh, use graphic source, source graphic offset, flip it on the x-axis, flip the uh, patch on the y-axis, rotate the axis 90, 180, 170 degrees, change the alpha or translucency of the uh, patch, and then also the uh, alpha or translucency style. And then you have options for changing the color of the patch or tile. So it could be normal, blend, tint, tinted toward a specific color by a certain amount, or you can even translate the colors of a patch if you already know um, what uh, colors from the palette that patch is using. So we're not going to worry about this too much right now. What we're going to worry about is just making a basic texture. So let's start by going down here and we're going to make a new texture name. We're going to call it something simple. Text 001. And of course, like with uh, most other file names in uh, ZDoom or the Zandronum engine, you want to make sure that the texture name is at or below eight characters. So you can see right here, when you create the texture, it uh, defaults to a size of 64 pixels by 128 pixels, which is this black box right here. So what I'm going to do is set it to 32 pixels by, I'll say 256 pixels. Actually, no, 512 pixels. And again, it helps to make uh, textures that are powers of two 
so that there's no issues with um, scaling them. And so we're also going to set the scale from 1 to 0 0.5. The reason we do this is because we're working with 8-bit textures here. Uh, the 8-bit tiles themselves are very small, so in order to make them look larger inside the Xandronum engine, you have to take the texture scale to 0 0.5, which basically doubles the size of the textures. And then we're going to set this world panning button on. And now we're going to attach our first patch. So the first patch we're going to attach is CMCP till or tile 1. And you can see it's already at the uh, top. If you want to see it in color, what you could do is just set the true color preview to on. And if you want to zoom in, set the zoom up. And then we're going to middle click on the texture screen right here. And that'll allow us to basically scroll up and see the texture in better detail. So you can see the first tile is on top. If I play with the Y offset, you can see it actually moves the texture down. If I set, play with the X offset, it moves the texture to the right. And if I set the X offset to something negative, it's going to move the texture to the left. I mean, the tile to the left. And then what we could do is flip it, change the rotation, like I showed before, change the alpha, although it doesn't really seem to have much of an effect here. Oh, there we go. By setting it to translucent, there we go. Now it works. And then, of course, you could blend it, tint it, a certain amount. But we're again just going to set it to normal right here. And then we can also even do translations. So if you know what the color, oh well, actually, let me let me stop myself right there. I'm going to do that later. Uh, for now, we're just going to add the next tile, which is going to be tile three. And now if you want to move this tile, right, you can use the arrow keys to move the tile in eight pixel increments. So by moving this four times, I've just set the X, uh, Y offset to 32 pixels. And so I'm going to be copying and pasting this tile several times. What I can do now is I can left click on the duplicate selected patches button and that'll create a copy. Right there it shows the X offset is 8, the Y offset is 40. And so we can use the arrow keys to move it back into position. This is a little tedious, I know, but one way we can actually speed this up is by selecting multiple tiles, like so, and then you can see it right here, they're both highlighted, and then creating duplicate tiles. And here we go, we left click these tiles again. Be very careful not to move them, by the way. They're pretty easy to move. But once you left click them both, you can move them both. And now what we can do again is highlight these other two tiles. And now we have four tiles highlighted and four tiles duplicated. Again, we're going to shift left click to make sure those tiles stay highlighted and use the arrow keys to move them. And then we can zoom, move the zoom back or rather uh, scroll down and then duplicate these again shift left click don't drag the mouse around just clicking them to highlight them and then using the arrow keys to move them okay so we're just going to do this a couple more times and now finally we can add the last texture right here cmp cp till 2 which is going to be at the very very bottom or rather, we're going to be placing it at the bottom. Whenever you add a new patch, it's always going to uh, set this default uh, offsets to zero, so it's always going to be practically at the top of the texture. So we can scroll all the way down with the mouse key. Continue scrolling down, and there we go. You have a full texture ready to use. We're going to hit the Save button right here in the left column, and it's going to save everything for us. So now we have a texture that is actually 64 pixels by 1024 pixels. And we can see it's completely covered from top to bottom. All right, good. And then once we're done with our work, we can see right here as well, the texture definitions generated by Slade, the texture name, size, X scale, world panning, patches, all that good stuff. So we're gonna save that work. And there you go, you've just made your first custom texture. Congratulations. Okay, now let's move on to custom sprites. So to get custom sprites inside of your map, you're gonna make two markers here, S start, S underscore start, and S underscore end. And you're gonna put this 
sprites right between these two markers here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab these PNG files here. These are my sprites. And so we're going to be using these sprites to make, <coughs> what should we call, uh, an actor or a custom torch. So you'll notice the naming convention of these follows a specific pattern. So you'll notice the first four letters are always the same. And that is required for actors. They're all supposed to have the same first four letters. And if you want to make your objects compatible with Mega Man 8-bit Deathmatch, it helps to not overwrite any of the four letter combinations that are already used by the game. Um, second thing, we second half of the uh, final name is basically the sprite letter and the sprite number. Now, sprite letters are simple. It's basically like frame A, frame B, frame C. And the sprite number uh, applies to the rotation. So from what I remember, uh, in the Xandron engine, you can have a, either one rotation, eight rotations, or 16 rotations. So in this situation here, I have, I'm have i only going to use run ro rotation, which means that when this item is added to the map, you're going to be seeing it. Um, it's going to look the same from any angle, regardless of what rotation it, it would be at normally. And so that's why the letter, I mean, the sprite number is set to zero for each sprite. And you see also, I've set the uh, graphics type to sprite so that I can adjust the offsets for this thing. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to v5d.pk3 and I'm going to copy the offsets uh, used in the original item here. So I'm gonna go to mm6, props, K to A0, and you can see the sprite offset here was set to 7 for X and 17 for Y. So that's what I'm going to do. 7 for X and 17 for Y. Okay. And here we see the offset 722 and 721. Okay. So it's going to ask me to save the offsets for entry for that sprite. And yes, that's what I'll do. And so now you'll see the offset right here corresponding basically to the center of the image. I'm going to set this to 7, set this to 22, make sure it's of type sprite, which is good. And then we're going to go to the next one, save the entity changes, 7, set this to 21, make sure the offset type is sprite, and save the changes. Okay, so now you can see right here all three frames have the same sort of offset, so they all look like they'll work together here to make the a small animation of a torch. All right, so we're going to save the file there. And that's pretty much it. That's a uh, custom sprites in a nutshell. Uh, recoloring and designing your own sprites. Uh, you can definitely do that. Um, there's definitely gonna be other tutorials for that, but right now I just wanted to show the basics of including custom sprites. So now we're going to make a custom actor to make use of the sprites. And to do that, we're going to make a decorate file. So you can see here, I've already made such a decorate file, but I haven't actually included any information in it. So what I'm gonna do, it's pretty unoriginal, but it is gonna be helpful here. I'm gonna to go to actors, miscellaneous, Mega Man 6, nightman.txt, and I'm going to copy all of the decorate code for the night torch and import it into my map. Of course, I can't just copy and paste willy-nilly. There are some things that I do have to change. First off, I'm going to change the actor name from Night Torch to CMCP Torch. And then next, I'm going to change the actor Doom Ed, no Doom Ed number from 10,540 to 13,540. Now, it's worth noting that a lot of actors in Mega Man Epic Deathmatch are between the range of 10 to 12,000. So if you want to be safe and make sure you're not overriding any of the actors in Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch, uh, a good starting point would be 13,000 and beyond. So that's why I set the actor number there to 13,500. So now you can see right here, there's a bunch of flags, there's a bunch of attributes, and there's a bunch of other text. So what we're gonna do is basically go through this one by one. So category, basically sets the item category. And this is very helpful when you're trying to make the map and you're trying to include items from, say, different Mega Man games. This will basically create a custom category inside Doom Builder so that um, it's easier to refer to this category 
and refer to these items for quick access. Now, solid basically means the item is solid. No gravity means that the item is not affected by gravity. I allow client spawn means it allows the client to spawn the item. Instead, force Y billboard basically means that it's going to have the billboard effect, which means that if you're viewing the uh, item from a high angle, it's going to look very squished. And if you're viewing it from like, uh, if you're eye to eye with the item, it's going to look very large, look, basically look like the normal sprite that we have here. Okay. So the height of the item is going to be 16 pixels, so it's going to be 16 pixels tall. And it's going to have a square radius of 16. So it's not a circular radius right here with the 16 pixels, it's going to be a square radius where basically the sides are going to be 16 by 16. Basically a 16 by 16 square. And then we're going to scale the height, I mean scale the radius and the height by a factor, no no not scale the radius and the height, but scale the sprites by a factor of 2.5. So that this sprite right here looks two and a half times larger than before. Okay, so now that we've set, established basically the properties of the item, we're now going to look into the states of the item. So there's only going to be one state for this item, that's spawn. And basically what this uh, line of code says, I'm going to change it really quick, so that's accurate, is that essentially using these three sprites right here, is going to cycle between frame A, frame B, and frame C at four ticks per frame. So every four ticks, it's gonna go from sprite A to sprite B, and then four ticks later, it's gonna go from sprite B, frame C, B to frame C, and then four ticks later, it's going to go from frame C to frame A again, because it's going to loop. And that's the only state available, so that's the basically the whole function of the torch. It's just gonna look there, take up space, and look pretty. Okay, good. So if you want to know even more about uh, Decorate, there is a ZDoom Wiki article that goes into more detail about Decorate format specifications, how a Decorate item is supposed to look, and I'm pretty sure there are plenty of experts in the Mega Man API Deathmatch community that can tell you even more about uh, sprite states, uh, spawn states, and all the different functions uh, that you can use inside of Decorate. Decorate is essentially what is used to make classes, and classes are you know what a lot of people tend to play these days so there you go okay so one more thing i wanted to cover was modifying and compiling scripts inside of slade since that's also possible instead of having to do it through uh, gz doom builder so you can see right here i've already got some scripts set up but i've always wanted to compile the scripts from slade so what we can do is we're actually going ahead and clearing out this entire script here and we're just going to compile a script too which is the death pit script so normally you would just go to ACS source right click the file and then go to script to compile an ACS but that doesn't work because we don't have ACC defined so to do that we're going to go to Slade preferences or rather, it will take us straight to Slate Preferences, and it's going to ask us the location of the ACC executable. Now, again, this is another reason I say it's a good idea to use uh, Doom Builder on top of Slade, because along with having a map editor, Slade, uh, Ultimate Doom Builder comes prepackaged with uh, compilers. So you can see there's compilers for BCC, Hexen, No Builder, Z Day, Mon, Z Doom. So we're just going to use the ACC file for Xandronum, and then for paths, we're going to set the path to Xandronum. So it's going to use all the files inside the Xandronum folder, and it's going to use Xandronum's compiler. And it's always going to show us compiler output. So we hit apply, we're going to hit OK, and now when we go to, oh, sorry, when we right click the file and compile ACS, a new window will pop up showing basically the log of things that happen inside of uh, whatchamacall ACS. Now I wouldn't worry too much about the error log because it doesn't actually show any errors. What it shows more or less is uh, the lines of code that were used and the variables and the uh, scripts that were created. But it doesn't show anything else. If there were any errors it would show right here in the line below. But because there's no errors 
there's no reason to worry. This is all a bunch of copyright information, giving credit where credit is due. And then when you are finished with compiling, you have this, the compiled ACS. Now you'll notice it's the exact same as the compiled ACS up here. So what we can do, we're gonna move this behavior up here and delete the old version. And now we can safely save the file with the new compiled scripts. Pretty nice, pretty simple. Um, although ideally you would do these um, script edits inside of GZ Doom Builder because it's again a lot easier to test the scripts inside of a map than it is to test inside of Slate. So now we finally reached the part where we're actually going to test everything we've added so far and we're going to see if it all works. So what we're going to do is we're going to close the file in Slate and we're going to open the file in, G in Ultimate Doom Builder or GZ Doom Builder, depends on which uh, editor you're using, but I like to use Ultimate Doom Builder, it's got a bit more fancy features. So you can see right here, cmcpxx.wad, it's going to show the game configuration is GZ Doom, Doom 2, UDMF, and we can change this to Z Doom or Zandronum, it doesn't really matter. And then with the above, select configuration, choose the map, and we already have the resources set up, so when we hit OK, it should start loading the map without issues. And as you can see inside the map, I've already got my own little skybox on the right side, all the items for spawns and all that good stuff. But what I really want to know is whether or not the new textures and new objects are loaded. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to make a couple of pillars, 64 pillars, uh, pixels wide, right here. I'm going to select both of the mid textures and I'm going to look for my own custom texture, which is right here, CMTEX001, which is good. Okay, and we can see it's loaded. It looks exactly how we the same as we set it up in Slade, and it makes the map look, I would say, 5% prettier than before. So, we did good. And of course, we can't forget about the torch. So what I'm going to do first <laughs> is get out of line death mode, then I'm going to go to things mode and I'm going to look for Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch props. And you can see right here the CMCP torch. And then right next to it, I'm going to add the Nightman torch for comparison. Okay. And you can see they both look practically the same. It's just that one is a recolor variant of the other. So we can see they both have a radius of 16, height of 16, and the scale has been set to, uh, what is it? 2.5, so now the sprites look 250% bigger than before. So we're gonna raise them to a normal height. That's good. And now we're gonna press F9 to test the map. All right, so everything looks good. And like I said before, the Y billboard forces the sprite to kind of squish up as you get closer to it. And then look normal as you for move further away. And you can see the textures look just fine. And you can see the little pit here should work as expected. I fell too far. And that's that. All right. But you'll notice that there wasn't any custom music playing. Well, about that. So this is kind of a problem exclusive to V5D, but custom music is simply not going to play when you're using your map in GZ Doom Builder or Ultimate Doom Builder. In order to use custom music, or at least listen to it, you have to load up the uh, WAD through Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch EXE, which again should be in your V5D installation folder. So we can open the executable, use the extra command line parameters to add the file, which I already have here, and then start the game. Also, you'll notice that I set the volume from 0.8 down to 0.45 because I didn't want to mutilate anybody's ears going through this test. So, I'm going to go into an offline skirmish. I'm going to look for the map we're working on, which I already have loaded. Uh, set the game mode to whatever, deathmatch works. And then, ta-da! Music works. So, 
if you want to also compare the volume of this music to something else, just do something simple like change miss woo moose. Or change miss hard moose. So I would agree that's about as loud as it needs to be. So we're done testing the custom music inside of the map. All right. So where does that leave us? So I did say I was going to show people how to recolor textures in GIMP. Uh, so to do that, we're going to install GIMP. Well, I already have it installed, but let's assume you already have it installed on your computer as well. And we're going to open up a random texture file, which I already have inside here. So I'm just going to open these three night textures. Now you'll notice right here that to my right, there's this thing called a Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch palette, which has basically all the colors of Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch. Now, obviously I had to import this. So to do that, what you need to do is you go to the palette window here. You're going to right click on any of the palettes and you're going to import palette. Now, you don't want to import from Gradient, you don't want to import from an image. What you want to do is import from a palette file. So let's see here. I'm going to go to Slay 3 Tutorial Files, and I'm pretty sure I put the palette in here. Here we go. Play pal.pal. And you can see in the preview window that it has all 256 colors of the Mega Man 8 bit Deathmatch palette. So you can see right there. We can give and rename it as well. We'll call it MMAPT Match Pal. Okay, good. And so when we go to the palette editor on the right, you can see that all 256 colors are available for us to use. So why is this important? Well, what I'm about to do with each of these tiles is I'm going to color map them. And when you color map something, you're basically um, changing the format of the image so that it only uses the colors that it needs. So to give a better idea of what that means, I'm going to go to image, mode, and indexed. And so I'm going to use the custom palette, Oops, the Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch palette to convert this image to index colors. So right there, you can see that a color map has been created that consists of simply four colors, dark green, white, light green, and black. And this is great because what you can do now is essentially pick a color from the palette we'll say this brown right here and then change all green dark green pixels in the uh, tile to the brown color and as you can see it makes the change instantly and efficiently so now we can do the same thing here change out the light green for a, I guess a light orange and we can go a step further by changing the white to something a little lighter. Actually, I'll change it to this. Let's see if that helps. See? So now you have a much, um, much different tile than what you had before. Something that looks more like a, which we call ancient temple than a green castle. And you could do the same thing with all the other images here. Now the reason I insist on doing this in GIMP is because uh, as it turns out, GIMP comes with features to implement Python scripts. And these Python scripts essentially allow you to automate a lot of the things I'm doing here. Basically automate the process of editing and color map. So in theory, and uh, I'm not saying you have to do this to be the best mapper ever, but in theory, what you could do is create a script that essentially indexes all the tiles and then converts tiles of a certain color. I mean, yes, converts pixels of a certain color to pixels of another color. So you could see right here, I'm just making sure that all the light green images, unlimited light green pixels are converted to light orange pixels. And then making sure all the white pixels 
are converted to well, we say yellow pixels or golden pixels. And so now that we've uh, indexed the image and now that we've changed the color map, what we can do is export this image as a PNG file. So we're going to call it something different. Haha T01. And then it's going to show us the settings for exporting the image as a PNG. So we want to make sure that all these values are unchecked, except this one should normally be checked if there's any transparent pixels. So save color values from transparent pixels. Yes, you want to do that. And then the automatic pixel format can be changed to either 8BPC RGB or HBPC RGBA. 8BPC RGBA is recommended for uh, transparent pixels, whereas APPC RGB is recommended for simple tiles like this. Change the compression level to 9. You make sure you don't save any XF data, make sure you don't save any XMP data, make sure you don't save any IPTC data, and make sure you don't save a thumbnail because that also takes up uh, file space. So right there we have it exported and if we go to the slate files here, oopsie doodle, we can see that the exported image is 297 bytes compared with the original image, which was 499 bytes, which is pretty good. Now, of course, a lot of uh, the, uh, whatchamacall, tiles inside of Mega Man 8-Bit De Deathmatch are already pretty well compressed. So in, that th so in theory, they should also be um, have indexed colors and should be easy for uh, changing the color map of those colors so that you can recolor the textures pretty easily. So, there you go, last one here, and if we go back to the desktop, we can see that all three of these files are pretty well compressed, taking up no more than 500 kilobytes compared to the 500 bytes that were taken up before. All right, so that's how you recolor tiles and sprites in GIMP. Now, in theory, it's also possible, no, not in theory, but it's also po simply possible to recolor textures inside of Slade. So that's what we're gonna do next. Okay, so in order to recolor textures and tiles in Slade, it's a little trickier, but definitely a lot more efficient. What you wanna do first is you wanna open up Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch V5D, and this will provide the palette that we were going to work with right here. After you've done that, what you want to do next is open up the map which has the textures you would like to take. So I made textures from Mega Man 6 Nightman by recoloring the tiles. So now I'm going to show you how to do it by recoloring the textures. And right now I'm not going to touch anything here. What we're going to do instead is we're going back to our original map file and opening up our original textures and we're going to make a brand new texture. Now I usually like to copy and paste textures simply because it's a little easier to do the cleanup. You can set the size to whatever, so your scales can stay the same, world panning will stay the same, and you can just clear out the tiles by highlighting all the tiles and then hitting delete. Now what you really want to do is you want to add a texture. But you can see here that there is a list of textures and tiles that you don't really want. So to sift through that, what you're going to do is let, click on the arrow here for all, click on the arrow for textures, click on the arrow for V5D, and then left click on Mega Man 6 Nightman. And as you can see, there's already a pre-made list of textures ready for us to use. So I'm going to go with King Green 2 since that looks pretty similar to the texture I made before. Except a little better, obviously. So, as you can see, we didn't have to import a bunch of tiles, we didn't have to recolor a bunch of tiles, we just had to import one patch right here. So, the last part is apply the translation to this patch. So to do that, we're going to toggle the patch color to translation, and we're going to hit the edit button. 
Now here is where things get a little tedious as well. So you can see here the origin range, which is basically the range of colors seen here. And the target range is your desired color. So I want to turn something blue or dark blue. So what I can do is either set all the dark, uh, the black pixels to dark blue, or what I could do instead is try and set the dark green textures to dark blue. Now it would be a little easier if you just zoomed in, so that's what I'm going to do here. La -di da And I'm going to set it to the right. And I'm going back to translation. So, this is a bit of a guessing game. You gotta guess what color the tiles are, and then see what colors you want to replace them with. So it looks like I did already find the tiles for dark green. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change it with light purple or light blue. And as you can see here, all the pixels of a certain color have been changed to a different color. Now we got to repeat the process again by adding a new translation range right here. And now we're going to play a guessing game again. Looks like we did get a lot of color changes there, which is good. So we're going to go ahead and apply the color translation here. And as you can see, all the uh, pixels of a certain color change to pixels of a different color. Repeat the process one more time. And again, it's a bit of a tedious guessing game, but once you remember all the colors, or get used to selecting different colors, then it becomes a bit more understandable. And I just realized that I was actually looking through the wrong pixels. Here we go. I'm sure I'll hit the right color texture eventually. It also helps to set the translation tar the target range to a bright color so it's easy to tell when exactly you've hit the mark. So that looks like I've hit the mark there. So we're going to change it to a better color now. Dark blue. And ta-da! You have a translated texture. Now you notice when I left uh, middle click and drag, it changes the colors immediately. But that's okay. Now we could do this for the last two colors here, but I just wanted to show a demonstration and show how efficient it can be as well. So you only have to import recolor one patch for an entire texture. So we're going to click save our settings. We're going to exit out of the texture editor. And now if we look at the texture definitions, we can see our new texture has been created simply by importing one patch and applying one line of code to translate the colors, which is good. It saves us file space and it saves us time if we know what colors to translate. So we can now go ahead and close out these files as well and start adding this texture to our map. So I'm gonna reopen the map file again. And now I'm going to make another set of pillars. This time I'm gonna make it here right next to the orange pillars that we made before. So these pillars I'm going to set to the Nightman texture, the original Nightman texture that we made. I'm sorry, not the original Nightman texture that we made, but rather the Nightman texture that we worked from, which I think was King Green 2. Okay. And now we're going to set these textures, to the unique texture that we made, which is CM Text. Now you'll notice immediately, right, that both of these textures actually look the same. And that's correct, because this texture this texture that we made is entirely based off of this texture inside of Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch. But when we go to test the map, the game will load our translation, and it will show the recolored textures to the right, the original and the recolor. Very simple and very efficient. Of course, I know you can make it prettier than this, but 
I just wanted to show a proof of concept. All right, so that's that. So I'd figure I'd end the video with some closing thoughts on using the Slade to edit maps in Mega Man 8 Bit Deathmatch. Overall, this can be a little tedious if you're new to it. And to that I say, don't be afraid and don't feel discouraged if things don't go right the first time. There's always going to be someone willing to help and there's always going to be ways to find help for yourself. There's plenty of tutorials around to help people understand what makes these textures files tick. And there's also plenty of tutorials to making Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch maps. Of course, a lot of the lessons that I taught here can also be translated to other games. It doesn't have to be uh, specifically Mega Man, it could be any other Doom mod. Of course, in Mega Man it's very simple because you're working with large 8-bit textures. There really isn't a whole lot of thought you have to put into uh, lighting or what enemy placement or anything like that. Still. I feel that this game is a great stepping stone for people to want to get into game design and also understand the mechanics that go into game design. The scripts, the textures, the images, how it all blends together to create a game that feels fun to make as it is to play. But seriously, if you do need any help, uh, I would definitely recommend just going to the ZDoom wiki for ideas. It is probably where I got most of my ideas from as well. Um, if not, there's plenty of other tutorials around. I'm going to link one in the description, for example, that also goes into making actors inside of Slade. And I'm sure there's also going to be people inside of the community who know a lot more about Decorate than I ever could that would understand a bit more about why certain properties work the way they do. I just wanted to make this tutorial to get people off the ground and to get people a basic understanding of what it goes into making mods for this game. So, with that out of the way, I think it's time for me to say my goodbyes uh, and just leave with one more, lot, one more thought. There's a quote that I always like to follow, and the quote goes like this. Good artists copy, but great artists steal. And so I'm going to show the webpage that talks about this quote. And what this page talks about is the history of the quote, but also the idea behind the quote. People who steal harshly, who are blatantly copying from others and barely changing anything, will be punished like they should. But people who understand the foundation that goes into those ideas, the foundation of thinking, and can reshape the foundation to suit their needs, those are the people you can talk, call truly creative. It would be fair to say that Steve Jobs didn't make the first MP3 player. It would also be fair to say he probably stole the idea from somebody else. But his understanding of the MP3 player is what allowed him to create the iPod and to sell the iPod and make the iPod the most popular MP3 player in the world. And from there, he created touchscreen, he helped Create, popularize touchscreen phones, he helped popularize tablets. Even though he wasn't the first to the idea, his creativity is what allowed him to reform these original, uh, reform these copied ideas into something entirely original or something entirely new. And as a result, he became a very successful businessman. But if there was one thing I want people to do differently from Steve Jobs, it's to give credit where credit is due. Doom is a game built off decades of work from other people. Starting with the id team, continuing on with the Zandronum team, continuing on with the Mega Man 8-bit deathmatch team, continuing on with the classes team, continuing on with the competitive classes team, continuing on to whatever mod is derived from competitive classes. The idea being that you can't exactly claim an idea as entirely your own, and you shouldn't be surprised when people end up taking your ideas and doing something different with them. That kind of creativity is what keeps the Doom community thriving, in my opinion. And hopefully this video inspires you to be as creative as possible. To take whatever you need 
and to do something incredibly new and interesting with it. It could be a new map. It could be new textures. It could be new anything. It could be a brand new game built from scratch. But just understand that when you copy, you're trying not to imitate, but rather to innovate. Okay, so I'm done. I uh, hope you folks enjoyed this tutorial. I'm going to get some sleep now. Goodbye.